Hi, and welcome back to the Unseen Podcast, a podcast dedicated to missing people, unresolved cases, and UK true crime. Today we're going to be exploring quite a recent case, however one that is still shrouded in mystery, despite someone being convicted in the crime. Peter and Sylvia Stewart were the victims of a baffling and senseless murder in 2016, and a suspect was eventually tracked down. The strange and tragic thing is, however, Sylvia's body is still missing and has not been traced. This episode contains descriptions that some listeners may find distressing, so listener discretion is advised. Peter and Sylvia Stewart lived on Mill Lane in the village of Waybread. Waybread is a village located in the county of Suffolk, close to the border with Norfolk. Waybread is close to the market town of Dis which is just over the border in South Norfolk. The area itself is very historic. It contains several round tower churches and beautiful countryside. Mill Lane is surrounded by countryside on all sides and is a very rural location. The road itself is made up of just a single track, leading onto a slightly larger main road. The couple lived happily together, raising their family, and in 2016, Peter was 75 years old and Sylvia was 69. They enjoyed their time together and spent their days in their home or out and about shopping in the local area. They also went line dancing once a week at the local village hall. The couple were known to their friends and family as happy and without any problems. They regularly kept in contact with their family and they were known to be close to their friends. This was why at the beginning of June 2016, Peter and Sylvia's family and neighbours began to become concerned about them. It's reported in a documentary by Donald McIntyre about the case that the couple's neighbours had not seen them for a number of days and began to worry about their welfare. This was not usual for them and out of character. The couple had not been seen since the 28th of May. It's reported that one of their neighbours decided to go around to their house and knock on the door. There was no answer, however. The neighbour had even more cause for concern when they looked through the glass and were able to see that there was a pile of mail behind the door, as though the couple had not been there for a while. This worried the neighbours enough that they contacted the couple's daughter Christy to let them know what their concerns were. Christy herself was alarmed about what the neighbours had told her, considering that she had also not seen them for almost two weeks. Christy had last seen her parents on the 20th of May, and the neighbours got in touch with her on the 3rd of June. The fact that neither she nor the neighbours had seen them was strange. Christy decided to phone the police as she was worried about her parents' welfare. It's reported that when Christy got in touch with the police, they too were concerned about the situation. DCI Andy Guy from Suffolk and Norfolk Joint Major Investigation Team told the Donald McIntyre Murder Files documentary that he first heard about Christy's phone call on June the 3rd at around 10am. He explained that when he first heard about it, he was immediately a little perturbed, as something just didn't feel right about the situation. The couple were reliable and relatively low risk in terms of police interaction, and the fact that no one could get hold of them was not the norm. The police were quickly involved, and they decided that a visit to the couple's home was necessary. When officers attended the scene, they did not find Peter or Sylvia in the home. The scene at the house looked as though the couple had left in the middle of the day and while they were carrying out daily errands. It's reported that a laptop had been left in the living room on charge, as though someone had just been using it, and there was a half-prepared chicken curry being made in the kitchen. All of the ingredients were still on the kitchen worktop and had not been tidied away. This was strange as the couple were nowhere to be found in the house. The home itself was relatively tidy aside from this and the police could find no sign of a struggle or overturned furniture for example that suggested that there had been a break-in or an assault of any sort. DCI Andy Guy however stated that he did not get a good feeling from the situation and he was concerned that something had indeed happened to the couple despite the lack of evidence pointing in that direction. 
He would later explain that the police had a theory early on that they may indeed be dealing with a homicide and that it was an unusual scene. This, he stated, was not very common and the idea that they could be dealing with a double homicide was quite uncommon. An appeal was put together to try and track down the couple in the hope that someone may have seen them and could tell police where they were. In the meantime, the police began a larger search of the general area around the house in the hope that this may uncover some more evidence that may point to where the couple were. Officers searched the land around the home and it soon became apparent that there were some objects at the side of the home that looked out of place. These objects were described as bits of debris and random objects that were piled up on top of each other. DCI Andy Guy stated that these stood out, as the rest of the home and land were so tidy and pristine. This suggested to police that they may be on the right track investigating the general area. Officers continued the search and came across a path that appeared to have been flattened by people walking on it. At around 7.15pm a search was conducted down this path which led down to a stream. Investigators were immediately drawn to the stream where they spotted a black tarp in the water. It was evident to the police that there was a body wrapped up inside the tarp and unfortunately their worst fears were true. When the tarp was uncovered the body of a male was found inside. It would later be confirmed that this man was Peter Stewart. Police now launched a murder investigation as it was evident that something very serious had happened at the couple's home on Mill Lane and that family and friends had been right to be concerned about their welfare. There were a huge number of questions about what had happened at the home. Why had someone killed Peter and disposed of his body? And crucially, where was Sylvia? The area was searched thoroughly for any signs of her, however nothing was found. Peter's body was sent for a post-mortem to establish his cause of death. It was found that he had been stabbed nine times, seven times in the front and twice in the back. This attack was violent and had some elements of overkill. Peter was not a likely victim of murder and officers had the task of trying to work out why someone would have wanted to kill this elderly couple. Peter and Sylvia's family and friends also had to come to terms with what happened here and the fact that Sylvia was still unaccounted for. This must have been an unimaginable situation to have been in for their family and the police were also concentrating on finding out where she was. As Peter had been murdered, investigators sadly had to consider that Sylvia had also been killed. It was important to establish where the couple had last been and whether there had been any activity from Sylvia since then. Officers began to follow this line of inquiry and began looking into Sylvia's bank accounts and CCTV from the local area. They were able to find CCTV images of the last known place that the couple were seen together. Images showed that Peter and Sylvia had visited a farm shop at Pullham Market in Norfolk on the 29th of May four days before their absence was reported by their daughter. The images show the couple alive and well, and there appears to be nothing to suggest at that time that they were in any danger. This indicated to police that whatever happened to them must have occurred in those four days following this. From further investigation, officers were able to narrow down this timeline somewhat, as they analysed Sylvia's bank records. These showed that her card had been used on the 30th of May in the town of Grays in Essex, around 67 miles away from Waybread. Peter and Sylvia were from Essex originally and had lived in Grays 11 years previously. However, police were unable to find any reason why Sylvia would have been in that area that day. It was discovered that her card had been used four times at four different cash machines in the town and this certainly got the police's attention. CCTV images from those particular cash machines during that time that the card was used were obtained and these shocked and surprised the investigators. The person using the card was not Sylvia. In fact, they weren't female at all. The images showed a man using Sylvia's card. He was wearing what looked to be a one-piece fishing suit with a padded jacket over the top. He also had his hood up while at the cash machine. This struck police as odd considering it was almost summer and the weather was relatively warm. 
His outfit and demeanour were unusual, and there was, of course, the fact that he was using Sylvia's card, without her actually being there. This caused several alarm bells, and the investigation now focused on who this man was, and his connection to Peter's murder and Sylvia's disappearance. It was clear that the suspect had Sylvia's PIN number for her account, and this must have been obtained from the couple themselves. Whoever this person was, he seemed to be directly involved in the crime. The police continued to try and track down any trace of Sylvia, and began speaking to her family and friends to paint a picture of her and Peter's lives. This was important for victimology, and to figure out why someone may have wanted to harm the couple. They spoke to those close to her, including the couple's daughter and their son-in-law. It's reported in the documentary Murder Files that police spoke to Stephen Paxman, who was married to the couple's daughter Christy. He had been brought in for routine questioning, however the police were reportedly interested in him, specifically because he was known to have gone for a walk in the area at around the time that it was believed the couple had been attacked. This, however, was quickly ruled out by the officers, when CCTV of the Stewarts showed that they were still alive after the time that Stephen had been in the area. While Stephen was ruled out of the investigation, it was through him that the police got another lead that they believed was an important line of inquiry. Stephen's father, Sidney, got in touch with him to let him know about something that he found odd. He explained that his carer, Ali Chesame, had recently told him that he had done something bad and Sidney was concerned that this may relate to what happened to Peter and Sylvia. While this was not necessarily a direct link to the couple, it was something that the police believed needed following up with, and it's reported that two days later, on Sunday the 5th of June, police had officially made Ali Chesame a suspect in the case. It's known that officers had travelled out to Chesame's house in Tilbury in Essex, around 93 miles from Waybread in an effort to track him down and speak to him. However, when they arrived there, they found no one home. The house still appeared to be lived in, however, there was no one there. This only heightened the police's suspicions regarding his involvement, and it was at that point that a nationwide alert was put out for him, and also his vehicle. It's reported on the Suffolk Police's website that this alert quickly bore fruit. As Chesame's vehicle was tracked down by early Monday morning, the 6th of June, it was immediately a concern that the car was located close to the port of Dover, which suggested to officers that Chesame may have left the country and made his way into Europe. A search of his car was crucial to the investigation, and although this was further progress in the case, there was a worry about what may be found inside the vehicle, considering Sylvia was still missing. A full forensic search was conducted and officers opened the boot and checked it along with the inside of the car. In many ways it was a relief when Sylvia's body was not found, however it also meant that they had still not tracked her down. The car was analysed forensically for any connection to Peter or Sylvia. It would later be found that it did contain some DNA from both of them. It was reported in the East Anglian Times that police discovered blood on the driver's side door which would later be confirmed as Peter's, along with several grey hairs that were found in the boot, which forensic examiners linked to Sylvia. This was a huge breakthrough in the case, and finally gave some indication as to where Sylvia may have been, during or after the attack at her home. Despite this breakthrough, the fact that Sylvia had not been found was also extremely worrying. If she wasn't at her home and she wasn't in the car, where was she? The police were also dealing with the issue that Chesame's car had been retrieved, but he hadn't. The proximity to Dover meant that investigators now had to consider the fact that he may have gone overseas. Chesame's background was looked into closely by officers, as he had arrived in the country in 1999 and sought asylum. He arrived in September of that year and stated that he had travelled from Kosovo. He made his way across to the UK and told authorities that he was Yugoslavian. After arriving in the UK, he was given leave to stay and became a UK citizen in 2005. It's reported in the Eastern Daily Press that one of the referees on his application was Nellie Margaret Paxman, who was the wife of Sidney Paxman, who had told his son about Chesame's suspicious comments. 
Chesame had looked after Nelly in the last ten years of her life, and then went on to become Sydney's carer after he had a hip replacement. It was reported that Chesame felt quite close to Sydney, and felt that they almost had a father-son relationship, and even at times called him dad. The police quickly established that this had been Chesame's connection to Peter and Sylvia Stewart through their daughter Christy. It was clear that this is how he had come into contact with the couple. However, what was not clear was why they had been specifically targeted by him in this way. When the officers dug deeper, however, they uncovered that Chesame was in significant debt and had lots of financial problems. He had quite a serious gambling problem and it was known that he regularly visited betting shops in the areas of Tilbury and Grays in Essex, which was only four miles away from his home. It's reported in the same article in the Eastern Daily Press that he sometimes spent up to a thousand pound at a time on gaming machines and was known as a regular by the staff in these shops. To fund his habit, he borrowed money off people that he knew, including co-workers and Sydney Paxman, who reportedly gave him around ten thousand pounds over the course of two years. The worrying thing for police is that Chesame was known to use different aliases and had used the name Marco Costa when he was arrested for previous petty crimes, and when he was trying to secure money off people. They knew that this would be relevant when searching for his whereabouts. The fact that he was in financial difficulty also confirmed the motive for the couple's murders. Chesame needed to get his hands on money, and he clearly gained access to the couple's bank account as he was seen taking money out of cash machines. Due to the location of his car, police were sure that he must have fled to Europe, but the question was, where had he gone? An international manhunt was launched to try and track him down, with officers from Suffolk notifying Interpol and other European agencies to be on the lookout for him. It had only been a few days since Peter had been found dead, however police had narrowed down their main suspect. It was around 10 days after their initial contact with European authorities that they got a very positive tip. They received information that a man that was thought to be Chesame had been spotted in a hostel in Luxembourg City. A member of staff at the hostel had heard about the story and had actually seen some of his photographs. The staff member contacted police in Luxembourg who went out to the hostel to arrest him. It was initially unclear, however, if the authorities had found the correct person, as when they tried to detain him, he said that he was not the person they were looking for. He stated that his name was Vital Dappi, and that he was an asylum seeker from Albania, and not Ali Chesame. The authorities in Luxembourg were faced with a problem. They were unsure if they definitely had the correct suspect, and therefore Suffolk police had to come up with a way to try and establish his identity, aside from simply photographs and identification. It was soon established that Chesame had been arrested in Essex a few years previously, and his fingerprints were on file. These fingerprints were sent to the authorities in Luxembourg to compare to the fingerprints taken from the suspect arrested at the hostel. It's reported that these fingerprints matched the ones given by the suspect in Luxembourg. The suspect, however, still maintained that he was Vital Dappi and was not Ali Chesame. The extradition process was completed when police were able to show that Chesame and the suspect claiming to be Vital Dappi were one and the same through fingerprints, DNA, handwriting samples and a mole and a tattoo that were identical. Chesame was brought back to the UK and it's reported on the Suffolk Police's website that he was given an opportunity to work with police to explore the claim that he was actually Vital Dappi, but he refused this. Police were able to confirm that Chesame and his alias Marco Costa were also the same person. Despite the fact that he continued to state that he was not Ali Chesame, the police were certain that they had the correct man and that he had been the one to murder Peter Stewart. Police had uncovered several pieces of evidence in the case that pointed squarely at Ali Chesame. Aside from the CCTV of Chesame using Sylvia's bank card, other evidence was also linked to him. In his car, the police found both Peter and Sylvia's DNA, as well as 15 of his own fingerprints, proving that he had been in the car, despite his protest that he had nothing to do with it. 
his fingerprints were also found at his home in Tilbury, proving that he had also been living there. The shocking part of the investigation was that Chesame had also clearly been planning the attack and robbery of the Stuarts. The police found that he had searched for the Stuart family home on a work computer, and had actually travelled the journey from his home in Tilbury to Waybread several times in the months leading up to the attack. This was particularly striking because Chesame's home in Tilbury was just under a hundred miles away from the Stuart's home and there would have been no other reason why he had been in the area that the police could find. It would appear that he was in the area at the time and was motivated to commit the crimes due to his financial difficulties. While the police were now sure that they had the correct person and could now form a case against him, there was still one very important thing they didn't know. They didn't know where Sylvia was, and this was extremely distressing for her family. The police continued to search for Sylvia in the hope they may find some evidence as to her whereabouts. Officers conducted extensive searches around the Stuart's home and in the surrounding area. However, these searches didn't turn up anything. A thorough investigation was also done of the route from their home in Waybread to Tilbury, where Chesame lived. This also did not provide police with any further leads as to where she could be. Chesame's house was also clean, and Sylvia was not found at his address. The question was, why was Sylvia not found at the house with Peter, and what had happened? Despite the fact that Sylvia was still missing, the police charged Chesame with the murders of both her and Peter. He continued to protest his innocence, and claimed that he was not even Ali Chesame and that he was in fact a man by the name of Vital Dappi. The police were confident, however, that they had got the right man, and his trial began in January 2017. The prosecution laid out their case against Chesame, including the DNA evidence found in his car and the CCTV images of the man they believed to be taking money out of Sylvia's bank account. It's reported in a BBC article about the trial that Kareem Khalil QC for the prosecution stated that Sidney Paxman had told Chesame that Peter and Sylvia were millionaires, that this had been his motivation for wanting to murder them. They stated that Chesame wanted to get rid of his gambling debts and get himself out of the situation that he had found himself in. It was also stated that the police believed that he thought he could persuade the Stuarts to sell their home and that he could perhaps have got some sort of commission from the sale. The police had also heard from Sidney Paxman that he had told them that Tilbury Marshes would be a good place to dispose of a body. The jury also heard that he had resigned from his job at a recycling company the day before he travelled down to Dover. Chesame, however, stated that he was not the man they thought he was, and in fact he had never been to the UK before. He stated that he was not the man in the CCTV images, and that he had nothing to do with the Stuarts or their murders. This, however, was refuted by Sidney Paxman, who told the court about how he was his carer and had stated that he had done something bad before the crime was discovered. At the end of the trial, however, the jury did not agree with Chesame and found him guilty of both murders. Mr Justice Jeremy Stewart Smith told the court that the killings were exceptional and terrible and that Chesame was a ruthless and accomplished killer. He was sentenced to a minimum of 35 years in prison for the murders. Chesame continued to protest his innocence and state that it was a case of mistaken identity. It's reported in the East Anglian Daily Times that his barrister, Max Hill QC, read out a statement prepared by Chesame in which he said he would not kill a fly, let alone two people. He also stated he was not going to ask for mercy or forgiveness, as he had nothing to do with the murders. This, of course, must have been a blow for Peter and Sylvia's family. However, his conviction did finally get some justice for them. A statement by the family following the conviction read, To the twisted individual who committed this wicked crime, we hope you spend the rest of your miserable existence reflecting on the utter senselessness and brutality of what you did to two innocent people. Maybe one day you will find the moral courage to tell us where Mum is so that we may give her and our family some final peace. The fact that Sylvia was still missing and that Chesame hadn't divulged anything about her whereabouts made it even more distressing. 
the police did continue to search for Sylvia in the period after his conviction. However, they didn't find anything to point to where she may be. In June 2017, it was announced that Suffolk Police had stopped actively looking for Sylvia, however would continue to follow up on leads if they came in. Detective Chief Inspector Andy Guy stated, Although our active searching has stopped, as I said after the conviction of Chesame, I have promised the family that I will continue to follow up any information that assists in locating Sylvia, and this remains the case. I would also ask anyone who may have information to call us. Suffolk Police maintain that they will follow up on any leads. However, up until writing this, Sylvia has still not been found. It's awful that not only have their family lost Peter in such a tragic way, they also don't know where Sylvia is. The fact that they have not been able to get any closure is terrible, and I really do hope they can eventually find out where she is. If you have any information about Sylvia Stewart's whereabouts, please contact Suffolk Police's Incident Room at 01473 782 000. Thank you for listening to today's episode. I want to thank, as always, our Patreon supporters who really help to keep the podcast going. If you want to know about what we offer on there, including bonus episodes and ad-free early access, then have a look at the link in the show notes. If you want to support us further, you can leave us a review wherever you listen, or just connect with us on social media, on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and also find us on YouTube where you can subscribe. If you're interested in buying tickets for CrimeCon, which is happening on the 12th and 13th of June next year, then remember to use our code UNSEEN for 10% off your ticket and also access to all of our bonus content. The link is in the show notes. If you have any suggestions for cases, I would love to hear them, so please do contact me on social media or at theunseenpod at gmail.com. I hope to have you back here in two weeks, and as always, I'm Caprice, and this has been Unseen. Unseen.